you, thank you. How's everybody doing? <laughs> 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 Hi, Me too. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the invisible universe, which is something I study. Um, uh, specifically neutrinos, dark matter, and uh, there's actually dark energy in there, but I'm not even going to talk about it because it's too crazy. <laughs> okay, uh, I want everybody to look at their glass of beer, and then look up here, and uh, I want you. I want to hear from all of the uh, optimists in the room. Who says that this is uh, half full? <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, you're responsible for all the uh, cute kitten videos on YouTube, and I hate you. The glass is twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> Go ahead. You can heckle. It's okay. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I want to hear from the pessimists in the room. Who thinks it's half empty? <laughs> There's one pessimist? Okay, so. <laughs> who is making all those, uh, like, uh, dickish comments on YouTube then? Underneath the kitten videos? Can't, can't just be these. <laughs> okay, well, um, in reality, uh, the glass is actually 99.9999999999.8% uh, empty. Yeah. <laughs> so the pestles don't just win, they crush it. <laughs> Sorry, Optimus. Um, so what do I mean by it's mostly empty? The, the reality uh, that we have found out in, the, in just this last century is that virtually everything in the universe is empty. The, the atoms around us, everything, is almost completely empty. So, um, and, and just so you know, this, night, this uh, very large figure here is actually just uh, the least possible estimate. We actually don't know how empty it is. Uh, the more we probe reality, the more we find that things are smaller and smaller, but we can't actually tell how small it is. In fact, we, have, we built giant machines like the uh, LHC in Switzerland, and that, is, that machine is basically the limit of how empty we can find uh, space to be. And the reason I'm bringing this up and what this has to do with the uh, invisible universe is that um, basically that means that if space and everything is empty, there's all sorts of things that can pass through each other, and we're not even aware of it. Uh, and that's why the universe can be mostly invisible, is because unless things are actually bumping into each other, we don't know they're there. Okay, so, um, so everybody look at your hand for a minute, or you can look at this hand for reference. Um, <laughs> no, no. There's actually trillions and trillions of particles that we know about there's probably a lot more that we don't know about, but there's at least trillions and trillions of particles that we know about called neutrinos flowing through your hand every second. And most of these are coming from the sun. A lot of them are coming from the Big Bang. Many of them are coming from supernova, like billions of light years away. And there may be even more that we don't understand uh, coming from all sorts of different places. But the point is that most of these things are going on without us noticing the whole time. And so that's what I mean by that they're ghosts, is that we're essentially being crossed by particles every which way, and they just fly right through us and we don't even notice. So just to go back to that, uh, that beer analogy, you may wonder, well, why does it look like it's half full or look like it's half empty, depending on your personality? Uh, the reason is because um, they're made of atoms, and atoms have charge, and charge interacts with light. And that's exactly what we mean when we say something is visible, is that it interacts with light. That's pretty much the definition. Our eyes see light, and so we consider that to be something that's visible. But the light is actually interacting with the charges at a distance. It's not actually physically running into it. Okay, so uh, I want to give you a brief history of 
the invisible universe. It actually turns out the very first thing we discovered that was invisible was a very long time ago. I don't even know, I don't think modern history or any history, written history, has any recording of when we first discovered this in, invisible thing. And I'm going to show you a picture of what this invisible thing is. And I don't, okay, so it's in this picture, and I don't want, if you know what it is, don't shout it out. Just think to yourself and feel proud. Um, but it's in this picture. And I just want to hear, like, maybe applause as soon as you think you know what it is you're looking at in this picture that's invisible. All right, oh, that's pretty good. The rest of you are going to feel dumb in a second. Um, all right, I'm going to give you a little hint. I'm kidding about the dumb thing. Don't worry. Okay, here's my hint. Okay, who thinks they now know what's in the picture? Okay, all right. Of course, it's air. Air is what's in the picture that's invisible. But the important thing I'm trying to make by this video is that um, what, the reason you can tell that air is there is because of its action on things that we can see. So we see the leaves blowing in the wind, and that's how we know that there's air. And the same, we can feel it with our hands. It makes us cold. It makes us dry. Whatever. Um, so. Air is a great model for what the invisible universe is like. Of course, nowadays we know from, uh, from modern science and everything, air isn't actually that spectacular. It's not that different from us. We have oxygen in our bodies and we have uh, nitrogen in our bodies. So we now understand that there's chemicals in air that can be moved back and forth. But this was so mysterious to the ancients that they actually thought this was like a fundamental element of nature, that air was this thing that was uh, completely you know, on its own, just this invisible, mysterious thing that could move back and forth. We have a very different picture of that nowadays. Okay. Okay, so um, this is, this, up until, uh, at the beginning of the century, this was like the model we had of the, the entire universe. We said, okay, so there's air and there's chemicals and there's us. So we basically put everything into a little category. We said, there's protons which have charge, there's electrons that have charge, and uh, that made up ordinary matter. And then we said uh, everything interacts via light, and that's how we can tell if it's there. Um, and this picture worked great for a while because it explained all chemistry in the entire universe. Um, but uh, there was a, right around the 30s, right before World War II, there was a, there was a major problem that people ran into. And the problem was uh, this. Okay, so we had neutrons and protons inside the nucleus, and we were happy with that idea. But uh, people started doing careful experiments, and they noticed that if you take a nucleus and it's just wandering around, sometimes it can spontaneously decay. And when it does, sometimes the particles that came off of it, would they just shoot off to one side. And this was exactly like the leaves that I showed you in the beginning. There was clearly something happening to those other particles that they would shoot off to one side, but we couldn't actually see what was causing them to shoot off to one side. There was this missing energy and momentum. It was clearly there, but all we could see was the result. We couldn't see the thing itself. So um, this problem was solved by just an idea, and the idea was called the neutrino. And the neutrino was uh, basically first proposed by Pauli in 1930 and uh, Enrico Fermi later sort of solidified the idea. And then uh, finally, um, Majorana did some extra mathematical work on it. Now, he didn't actually really invent that, but I, I bring it up for two reasons. One, he's very related to the work I do, um, which is trying to test whether neutrinos are Majorana neutrinos versus uh, what's called Dirac neutrinos. I'm not going to get into what that is now. But another thing that's interesting about Majorana is that he mysteriously vanished. And, uh, and what he did is he just packed up everything. He didn't leave a note or anything. He just got on a boat, and he disappeared. And uh, <laughs> I thought of that one. That's pretty good. My theory was that um, time travelers from the future came to capture him to stop him from making an atom bomb for, uh, for the fascists in Italy. But um, he might have just fallen off the boat. <laughs> You may never know. Okay, but this is how he solved the problem. Uh, basically, imagine that you have this neutrino, and even though you can't see it, it's still there. And it solved the problem uh, wonderfully. So basically, we have, um, 
you have this nucleus is coming in, and then pow, it, it goes off, and the neutrino is there, and it takes off that missing energy and that missing momentum. And this suddenly solved everything. It made everything make sense. But the problem is no one could see these neutrinos. So even though the, the atom bomb was built with this model in mind, no one knew that they were there until much later in the 50s. And then the first neutrino was detected. And the only way it was detected was because now that we understood that this was its effect that it was having on the, you know, the leaves, the, the particles, we knew that that reverse process would also happen. So they could be detected in that same way. But it's, it's still a very difficult thing. Okay, so then uh, fast forward many, many decades, and uh, this is now actually how we see the, the world around us. We have something called the standard model of particle physics. And uh, it, here I have something called the up and down quark, and I don't wanna uh, you know, confuse anybody, but it, it, just think of it as like the neutron and the proton. It's actually a part inside. We now found out that there's even sub pieces of that, but they behave very much the same way the, the, um, the neutron and the proton work. But now we, we know that we have to add this uh, neutrino in there. Well, so this is now, you can sort of think of that as like ordinary matter. When I say ordinary, I mean it, it's the vast majority of what's in this room. Everything is made up of these four things, mostly. And, but unfortunately, nature being what it is, it's not so simple, and of course, she threw us a lot of surprises, and there's a bunch of other things. Uh, so we call these fermions. These are very similar. They obey a lot of the same rules, but they're heavier. Uh, and then we also have a bunch of more complicated interactions. Uh, in particular, there's the strong force, which is not uh, visible originally, but it's what binds nuclei together, and that's actually where the tremendous amount of energy comes in an atomic bomb and where the energy of the sun comes from. It all comes from the strong force. Um, anyway, it'd be nice if this were the end of the puzzle, um, but uh, this only explains the stuff that we know about today. Uh, there was one last missing piece up until a couple of years ago, and you probably heard about that. That was the Higgs boson. And that was sort of the final piece of this little mathematical puzzle that explains everything we can do in a laboratory. And, uh, and it looked very promising, but it has a huge flaw. And this huge flaw is that um, we have the standard model, it's great, but we know for sure that there's this huge collection of other stuff called dark matter. And dark matter just does not fit into this puzzle at all. And what we know about dark matter is that a lot like neutrinos, it just simply passes through us in all directions. But we cannot see it because it is, um, all intents and purposes, invisible uh, to most of these interactions. But we don't know exactly how many or, or how. So let me tell you how we know that dark matter is there. Okay, so this is just a little simulation showing uh, what it would look like if a piece of, uh, dark matter went across the sky. This isn't actually exactly how they do the experiment. It's just a simulation. But uh, Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that uh, light bends around things that have mass, and dark matter has mass. So astronomers, or astronomer friends, uh, well, they're kind of our friends. There's some hair pulling involved. But, um, but for the most part, they came to the conclusion a long time ago, almost the same time the neutrino was proposed, that this stuff had to be there that there was something out there. For a long time, they didn't know if it was maybe little black holes or extra planets that they couldn't see, but by the 90s, it was really obvious that it had to be something new, something that didn't fit into the standard model, because they could take pictures of the sky like that, and they could see that light was bending around something, even though there was absolutely nothing that we're used to, nothing that's made out of atoms or anything like that that we're used to. Uh, another really strong bit of evidence for dark matter is that uh, it comes from galaxies. If you go and look out at galaxies, it, to an astronomer, it is so much like the, the leaves rustling in the wind. The galaxies rotate much faster than they should be able to. If they were able to, uh, if they really had the mass of all the stars that you add up in a, in a galaxy, they would actually fly apart. And astronomers do lots of ex careful calculations and experiments, and they know that that can't be the case. And they can actually map it out very carefully. And that's why, uh, even though there's a little bit of distrust between us particle physicists and astronomers, 
we're, we think we're on the same page here. And so now it's all, it's our collective job to figure out what this mysterious particle is. And uh, the most amazing thing that I think uh, is, is about dark matter is that we actually now know it outnumbers us significantly. There is more dark matter in the universe than there is regular matter. So not only is it a ghost, it's, uh, it's actually the biggest uh, inhabitant of the, the universe. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically it. All right. Thank you.